In this pre-recorded section, I'm going to go through the camera and the spec and give you my thoughts on the handling, but I will be watching the questions and I'll be answering them afterwards. So if you have any questions, pop them in the comments and I will answer them as I go and come back to them afterwards. The GFX100S is our newest camera in the GFX range. It has the same sensor as the GFX100, but we've made some tweaks to the shutter and the in-body image stabilization unit. The camera is smaller and lighter and easier to use and carry. And we've also changed the ergonomics as well. The 100S has the same sensor in it as the GFX100. It's still 102 megapixels and is still backlit. It has 425 focus points, which are phase detect, and they use 3.78 million dots across the whole of the frame. So if you're shooting any sports or wildlife or any subjects that are moving fast, it will be able to track them. Also as well, like with the 100, you have face detection, which has eye priority, or you can choose the subject's left or right eye, depending on the shot you want to take. The 100S is a simple camera to use. We've put an MASP dial on the top, which will allow you to choose manual, aperture, shutter, or program. But we've also put on there six custom functions like we have done with the XS10. These custom functions can be used for a wide range of shooting situations. And you can change, for example, whether or not you're using single point focus or tracking focus or face detection. But you can also change things like the aspect ratio and the file size. So if, for example, you're out shooting landscapes one day, you want to have the camera set for a single point focus at 16 by nine aspect ratio, you can do. But then if you were doing sports or wildlife or any fast moving subjects, you could set custom two for autofocus continuous with wide tracking. So it makes it very fast and flexible to use for a wide range of situations. There are two card slots which run UHS-2 SD cards, and it will record RAW and JPEG or back them up or duplicate them as you want to. You can also record 4K video or HD movie on either of the cards as well. The controls are simple to use. You have the familiar front and rear command dial. There's a nice clear 1.8 inch screen on the top, which you can use to show your exif data as you shoot, or perhaps a histogram, or if you're a little bit more traditional like I am, the dial showing your shutter speed and ISO. The buttons on the back can be customized as you want to. It's really simple to do. If you just hold down display back for four seconds when you're in live view, uh, that will bring up a menu and you can set pretty much anything to whatever you want. Me personally, I have the button on the front here set to playback because I like it when I'm using a longer lens, but you can change it to whatever. The command dials can be set to shutter speed, aperture or ISO or exposure compensation as you want to, and they're dual function because they can be clicked into change between. The screen on the back of the 100S is a three-way tilting screen. You can pull it out for waist level photography. You can push it down if you're doing photography over the top, perhaps for macro or reproduction work. Or if you're shooting portrait from the waist, you can also pull it out like that. The screen on the back is nice and bright and clear, and it is a touch screen as well. So if you're working on a tripod, for example, and you don't want to use the dials or buttons, you can touch focus. Also, when you're reviewing with the camera, if you're reviewing an image, you can just double tap on the image on the screen and it will go straight through to 100% wherever you've focused. You can move around the image as you want to when you're reviewing and you can also pinch to zoom too. The 100S has a really bright and clear viewfinder. It is a 0.77 times viewfinder at 3.69 million dots and it refreshes at 85 frames per second. So if you're doing anything that does move, as you are moving, you're not going to get any screen tearing, so it's going to make it nice and clear and fast to refresh. All of the buttons and switches fall easily to the hand. On the back here, you have the autofocus mode switch, which allows you to choose between single, continual, or manual focus. And for the autofocus joystick, which changes your focus point if you don't use the touchscreen, we've made the pad wider and also made it a little bit bumpier so it's easier to feel, uh, not only when you're using it with bare hands, but also with gloves. For those that are perhaps going to use it for shooting video, there is a switch directly here for shooting between stills and moving. The 100S uses the same battery as the X-T4. Like the X-T4, it charges via USB-C and the battery is rated for 460 shots according to SEPA standards. It's a very light and manageable camera. It's about 500 grams lighter than the GFX100 and weighs 900 grams. Even with a slightly larger lens like the 250mm f4, the camera doesn't feel unwieldy or unbalanced. But if you do want a little bit more to grip onto, there is a metal hand grip available as well. So why the 100S? Well, as I said before, it's a 102 megapixel backlit sensor. So what that means is the circuitry is behind the pixel face, meaning more light can get to the pixels themselves, giving the camera greater tonality and better dynamic range. As it is a larger than full frame sensor, it's 43.8 by 32.9 millimeters. So it's a four by three aspect ratio. That's going to give you shallower depth of field and more pleasing bokeh. Also as well, if you're shooting portraits, for example, Instead of it being very tight on the shoulders of the subject, the four by three aspect ratio gives a little bit more width, which means you don't have to be as far away from the subject as you would normally have to be. 
Also for printing, 4x3 is 8x6. For those that need extreme detail for archival or reproduction work, the 100 megapixel sensor in the GFX100S can be used with the pixel shift option. This will give you a 400 megapixel photograph with no false color. So how have we managed to make it smaller and lighter? Well, as I mentioned, we use the same batteries in the X-T4, the MPW-235, but the in-body stabilization unit and the shutter block have both been redesigned. The shutter block gearbox has been redesigned, which allows the shutter to trip faster, but it also makes it about 20% lighter. Using the experience that we've got with the XS10 and the XT4 and the GFX100, we were able to modify the in-body stabilization unit on this to make it again about 20% lighter, but offer more functionality than on the GFX100. This will now stabilize to six stops instead of five and a half on the GFX100. And like with the rest of the cameras, that will work with the lenses if they have stabilization or not. For those lenses that do have stabilization in them, that will complement those lenses and will give the fifth axis of roll. For those that don't have stabilization, the sensor itself will stabilize the image. As well as the new gearbox on the shutter, there is a shock absorbing unit which allows the shutter to actuate faster. Like the rest of the GFX range, the 100S is a weather resistant magnesium body. This has 60 seals, which will allow you to take photographs in a wide range of conditions. And like the lenses will also be able to be used down to minus 10 degrees C. With the weather resistance and lighter weight, trekking out to get that ideal landscape shot is no longer a hardship. So traditionally, a larger sensor camera is designed to be used in the studio. However, the GFX100S is capable of being used for things that move, so wildlife and sports. With the 425 phase detect autofocus points that use just under 4 million pixels that covers the whole frame, you can track a subject easily. It'll pick up a subject and track it in 0.18 of a second, and that's even when using it with the five frames per second in the mechanical shutter. If you're shooting in low light, uh, when you're using a lens like the 80mm f1.7, the camera will focus down to minus 5.5 EV. If you are somebody that's looking for a high-end video camera as well, the 100S will be able to do that for you. It'll shoot DCI 4K at 30 frames per second in log, HLG, and ProRes 12-bit format. Uh, if you're recording internally, it'll shoot 420, 10-bit at 400 meg per second in log. And if you're shooting externally via the HDMI, it'll do 422, 10-bit, 400 meg per second. A nice added bonus of this is that it will shoot for two hours. There's no crop on the sensor as standard for video, so you're able to get that full tonality and bokeh. You can set the crop on the magnification to 1.1 times for easy framing between using and not using digital image stabilization. The 100S will record in H.264, and AAC, but it will also record in H.265 if you want it to as well. As we are Fujifilm, we've got 80 years of color science technology behind us, and our films that we would have used back in the day are now on the camera. There are 19 film simulations, including the new Nostalgic Negative, which is reminiscent of American new color photography that emerged in the 1970s, and is designed to create the look of photos in old photo albums and give a nostalgic feel. When shooting RAW, you have the option of putting the film simulation on afterwards, However, for ease of use, if you want to shoot the film simulation straight out of the camera, it'll look something like this. As this is a GFX camera, you can use the entire range of all 12 GF lenses. They go from the 23mm f4, which will give you the equivalent of 18mm effective on full frame, right up to 250mm, which will give you about 200mm on full frame. There's also a 1.4 teleconverter, which will work with the 250 f4 for when you need to get those subjects at very long range. If you're doing macro work, there is a 120mm f4 half macro, which works with the extension tubes. And if you're doing portrait, the two lenses I would suggest are either the 80mm f1.7, which will give you 65mm effective, or the 110mm f2, which will give you the equivalent of about 85mm. As you'll see, I've got the new 80mm f1.7 on the camera, which is outstanding for portraiture. 
Here's Christina Varaxina giving her thoughts on it after she used it. My attraction to photography actually really reflects my interest in people. I really want to get to know people more. I want to see what their enigma is. I like creating different worlds where those people can exist. Overall, I think my style is pretty clean. I want to focus on the character, on the emotion, on the feeling. I'm the kind of photographer who doesn't like to rush, but at the same time, when I start shooting, I shoot pretty fast. As a medium format lens, I find this GF 80mm 1.7 lens quite compact. I like shooting handheld, so I move around a lot. So I really appreciate that this lens is actually not so heavy and compared to other lenses of a similar focal length, it's very easy to use. When you work with people, what is really important is the right emotion. My job as a photographer is to get that out of my subject. So the lens that provides an opportunity to actually go as wide as 1.7 f-stop, it really helps me. And when I focus on the eyes of my subject, the eyes stay sharp and then everything else can stay soft and out of focus and don't interfere with that feeling. I've used other lenses with a wider aperture before and you kind of know what they are. When I put this one on, it blew my mind. It just did not look like a photograph. The softness of the background is just unbelievably smooth. It just looks like a painting. This is a true beauty of medium format combined with a, such a beautiful lens. If you're using the GFX100S in the studio, we are hoping that Capture One will support tethering on it on or around launch day. We are working with them, so hopefully that'll be there soon. If you're doing street or documentary photography, there is the 45mm f2.8, which will give you a 35mm, which of course is the classic focal length. However, if you're looking to go just a little bit longer, there is the smaller and lighter 50mm, which is a pancake lens as well. The 63mm f2.8 is a standard lens as that will give you the equivalent focal length of about 50 millimeters. And if you want something between the 23 and the 45, there is a 30 as well, which will give you the equivalent focal length of about 24 millimeters. So where does the 100S fit in the range? The GFX 50S and the 50R are our 50 megapixel bodies. The 50S has a very similar kind of layout to this. It has the three-way articulating screen but the 50S also has the ability to have a tilt adapter, which means the viewfinder can be tilted up and to the left and the right, perhaps for portrait or on a tripod. The 50S also has an AC power in, so if you are using it in a studio for a long period of time, that will be useful because you won't have to change batteries as much. The 50S also has the option of having a battery grip on the bottom if you are shooting in portrait a lot, or if you just want to have two batteries in the camera and not change batteries so much. The 50R and 50S share the same internals. The 50R though is a rangefinder style camera which is smaller and lighter. It's great for people doing travel or documentary photography or for those hiking up a mountain and want something nice and small and light. Obviously the 50S and the 50R are both cheaper than the 100 and the 100S as they have a lower resolution sensor, although 50 megapixels is still a huge amount of data. The GFX100 is a bigger version of the 100S essentially. Whilst the shutter block and image stabilization unit on the 100S are more advanced than the 100, they are still very effective. The in-body stabilization unit on the GFX100 gives five and a half stops of stabilization and works in a very similar way to the GFX100S. The GFX100 and 100S have a very similar specification sheet, although the 100S is more advanced with its in-body stabilization unit and focusing and shutter block. The GFX100 has a higher resolution viewfinder that's larger and refreshes faster. And it also has the ability to have two batteries in it rather than one. Like with the 50S, the GFX100 has a vertical grip if you're shooting portraits, but it is a fixed grip, whereas on the 50S it's removable. Again, like the 50S, the 100 can be run off the mains if you're using it in a studio full time. And it is a slightly larger camera to hold on to as well, especially if you're using it with gloves. It has a second LCD screen underneath the main screen, which can show you a histogram or EXIF data. Again, like the 50S, you can put the tilt adapter on the GFX100, so if you are shooting portrait or perhaps on a tripod, you can raise up the viewfinder and look straight through it if you need to be absolutely critical on your fine focus. 
as we all know, checking focus through a viewfinder is better than on the rear screen. So the 100S has all of the features and specifications of the 100, but in a smaller, lighter, and better body. And of course, importantly, it's cheaper as well. It can be used by anyone for pretty much everything. The phase detect focus means that wildlife and sports photographers will be covered, as well as anyone that's shooting any young children running around quickly. The face detection means that portrait photographers will be able to focus quickly, especially if you're doing something like a wedding, it will lock on really fast. And for landscape photographers, the 102 megapixels will give you outstanding results and brilliant resolution. As I said at the beginning, I'm going to be answering some of your questions now, so stick around and I'll go through them. Fire away. Hello everyone, good evening. Um, thank you for watching the video. I hope you found that informative. Um, so what I'm going to do now is hopefully go through some of your questions. Um, as I said on the, on the video, uh, pop them through and I will, um, I will answer them as we go. Um, so looking through, uh, where are we? Um, we have a question about dynamic range compared to the 50R. Uh, yeah, there's a little bit more on it. Um, the numbers specifically I haven't seen yet. Um, but it's about a stop-ish. It'll depend on how you're using it. Um, it'll also depend on the dynamic range mode that you're using. I tend to uh, change the dynamic range modes depending on the scene. On all of our cameras, you have the option of changing the dynamic range mode from 100, 200, and 400%. Uh, the way that works is essentially um, it'll change the ISO and then change the amplification and then give that the image in a slightly different way. So it'll increase uh, the ISO, reduce the amplification and give a nicer shot. So you're keeping the highlights and the shadows nicely exposed. Uh, so depending on the scene, I tend to shoot in either kind of dynamic range 100 or I will increase up to dynamic range 400. But of course the, the GFX 100S will have more dynamic range than the 50s. Hope that, hope that answers your question. Um, so where are we having a look through, uh, I have a question. Is there a measure of how you've improved the AF, um, over which camera, if it's over the, um, 50 S and the 50 R, uh, you will notice that it's a phase detect rather than a contrast detect system. So the phase detect system will use uh, higher res, uh, will use some of the pixels on the sensor to actually see the depth of the subject and see whether or not it's in focus and therefore we'll be able to react and focus quickly. On a contrast system, what it will do is look at the whole scene and gauge uh, from the scene that it's looking at whether or not the subject is in focus. So it won't be able to gauge depth, but it will look and see, is that part of the scene that you're focusing on sharp? The downside of a contrast system is that uh, it is slightly slower in lower light, um, but the plus side is that every single pixel on the sensor is purely there for image quality. On a phase detect system, uh, if you the, the pixels are used for autofocus and image recording. Uh, so if you were to underexpose it uh, and then increase your ISO hugely in the camera and really put it outside of, of what you would do sensibly uh, in a photographic sense and try and pull out a lot of stops of, um, or recover it by a lot of stops, you might possibly see a phase detect array, but I've only ever seen that happen on any camera with phase detection when someone has tried to do it rather than it actually happening in real life. So it doesn't actually matter. Um, so phase detection system on the 100 and the 100S will of course be faster than the contrast, uh, contrast detection system on the 50s. Um, so uh, there's another question. Uh, is it possible to shoot 16-bit uh, with continuous focus? Yep, no problems at all. That'll be absolutely fine. That will be all good. Um, just scrolling through as well. Um, will the custom settings apply for videos? So six for still and six for videos. Uh, no, the videos I believe are a separate. On our cameras, on the on the recent cameras, you have a separate menu specifically for video. So you can set the videos as you want to. Custom one to six will apply for stills, um, but the videos you can set separately, and that that goes right through, not just from kind of uh, film simulations, if you're using them for video, but also for um, you know, bit rates, your codecs, everything. So the, the video menus are separate across, so you can save them uh, from there. Uh, so that, hopefully, I'm just looking through to see if I've uh, missed any other questions. There's another one just here. 
uh, where are we? Can you guys work with the Adobe to correct, get the correct Fuji color simulations to the colors that should be correct colors like Velvia? Uh, C1 doesn't have the correct colors. Capture One doesn't have the correct colors for Fuji science either. So the um, the, the software, uh, so Lightroom Capture One, um, they will have uh, film simulations that are extremely close to what we have, to be fair, because they've worked it out. What you can do, though, is use your camera through uh, XAcquire, I believe it is, um, through XAcquire, and you can use your camera to process the rules into, uh, the, um, into the exact film simulations that you want to. But I, on the... on uh, Adobe and Capture One, the, the colors are very close, I found, but of course you can tweak them very slightly afterwards as well. Uh, where are we? Any more questions coming through? Um, here we go. Nope, that looks like I think I have answered uh, that looks like I've answered pretty much all of them. If there are any questions that I've missed on the chat, um, then uh, drop Wex a line or email me, or email Wex and they'll email me and I'll get in touch and I'll happily answer those for you afterwards um, because I, I think I've got all of them. But just in case I have missed them, I will of course answer them later on. That's no problems at all. And you, you'll probably be able to find this on the Wex Facebook page as well. Um, and I'll keep a tab on that too and you'll be able to see them. So I mentioned on, a, on the talk, uh, I mentioned a couple of things about the control layout. And what I wanted to do was show you that in a little bit more detail. So if I show you on here just for a second, you should now all hopefully see um, the top screen, the LCD screen. That's the 1.8 inch screen on here. Now I mentioned that you can customize it with your EXIF data. So this area here where it's got the shutter speed, the aperture ISO, and these symbols as well, they can be tweaked to how you like them. So personally, unless I'm working in a studio or doing a set piece, um, I tend to run aperture priority auto ISO. And the way I limit my auto ISO is that I'll have, because um, we have three ISO settings, auto one, two, and three, I will have auto one set for a slowish shutter speed, somewhere around kind of a 60th to an 80th, give or take and I'll have it as a base ISO and then top ISO. I'll let it go through the full range um, and, and let it run free essentially. Because as long as the uh, shutter speed is over my base, um, and as long as I'm on my raw ISOs, I don't mind what it shoots at for me because I tend to shoot a lot of black and white. So I will personally change this to aperture, then ISO, and then shutter speed. Personal choice, you can change it as you want to. Um, some people will want more, some people will want, will want less. Um, equally, when I'm shooting in RAW, I will tend to leave my white balance in auto. So for me, this symbol isn't uh, isn't crucial for me. I don't need it. So I would perhaps change that to uh, the battery indicator or maybe my aspect ratio, something like that. So you can change that as you want to. Now, I mentioned that uh, I'm a little bit more traditional as well. Uh, I do like having the dials here. So you can see here the ISO. Now, granted, when I am in the auto ISO, all it's going to do is show me ISO 1, 2, and 3, which I tend to know where I'm at anyway, depending on what I've been shooting recently. But the shutter speed dial here is quite nice, and you have your, uh, your exposure meter here as well, and the aperture across, and your mode here. So whether you're in manual, aperture, or shutter, or program. So you've got those there if you want to. Um, for the histogram, of course, as well, we have the histogram just here if you want to. Now, you can also have the histogram showing in the screen. That's a display option. And you can change a lot of the display options too. And that will show in the viewfinder as well. But you can choose to have it as you want to. Uh, if you are working off a tripod and you want to see the histogram, you may find that that's clearer, perhaps in very bright sunlight. Or you might actually just prefer to have it in, on the top screen there as you want to. I also talked about the uh, custom mode dials. The custom mode dial is here. This is the MASP dial, which is uh, new for the GFX series. Um, this is a lock on here. So you click that in, that's a toggle lock. So that's click in for lock, click out for unlock, and then you can rotate it and click it in uh, as you want to. So nice and simple and nice and clear. Obviously, as I said, you've got your um, mode here showing you whether you're in MASP, but you also have it on the mode dial as well. So really simple and clear to see. Um, I talked about the uh, control layout, um, the joystick. I'm going to go in a little bit more detail about that. It's a small thing, but it's the little things that make the difference. So the pad on the back of the joystick is a, is a lot wider, uh, and it's a little bit rougher as well. So 
the, the joystick on the rest of the range is easy to use, there's no problems at all. But if you are using gloves or if you're trying to move it around quickly, it can be quite small. And perhaps if you're using all 425 focus points rather than the 117, because you've got two options, um, perhaps you might skip past the point that you want or you might not to. Equally, that might just be me being clumsy. But I find that the larger pad is slightly easier to use to get exactly the focus point that I want. It's a little tweak, but as I said, it, it's a nice one. And I, I appreciate it. Um, also, a little tweak that I, I don't think I mentioned uh, is the command dial. Uh, again, we get feedback from our photographers uh, and from users as well. And we've made the rear command dial a little bit bigger. So it's now the same size as the one on the front. Uh, so if you are using your uh, 100S in kind of a DSLR kind of way, so you've got um, your aperture at the front, your shutter speed at the back, or vice versa, and you're changing through the wheels, not through the aperture ring at the front, um, getting the third stops to be absolutely spot on now is perhaps a little bit easier. It's, it's a larger wheel, so it's a little bit more of a deliberate travel uh, between each click. And again, it's a little thing, but I really appreciate it on the time I've had with it. Um, I also mentioned as well in the studio, uh, you've got your USB-C port and your mini HDMI, but this is a little thing uh, which is a little bit old school, but again, I appreciate it. But granted, a lot of us now are using uh, TTL triggers in the studio uh, for shooting and controlling, especially if you're using high-speed flash sync. However, if you're using a slightly more older system um, or you just want to be able to share quickly across a, a trigger that just fires rather than gives any TTL information, you can, of course, put it in the hot shoe, but you have also got the PC sync port as well, uh, just here if you want it. Um, I talked about the grip too. Uh, the grip is here. This is the base plate. For those people who are using it on a tripod, um, that is an Arca Swiss standard, so it'll just bolt on. And as I said, it just gives a little bit more real estate here just to hold on to uh, if you've got larger hands or if you just want it to feel a little bit larger, especially when you're using it with a 250. Uh, so hopefully that will that will flesh out a couple of the points I made about the uh, about the 100s in the video. Uh, so we'll come back to the questions. Um, Owen, hello Owen, you were in the chat earlier on the on the um, GF uh, on the GF lens talk that I did. Um, is there a compelling reason to get the 100 versus the 100s for studio work? Um, people not product. The tilt finder is unimportant to me. Thanks. Um, prints on paper. No, because they are the same sensors, so they will give the images. Obviously, you've got the new film simulation on the 100S. Um, however, from a functionality point of view, it will depend on how you want to use it. Uh, the 100 has the ability to be plugged into the wall via the AC15V, I think it is, mains adapter. So if you are using it for an extended period of time, um, you don't have to worry about battery management. Not that you have to worry anyway, really, to be fair. I mean, when I've been using the camera, uh, to do a little bit of videoing, I've just plugged it in. But if you're tethering and shooting as well at the same time, the ability on the GFX100 to plug it into the mains for a long period of time for power in that way is useful. Um, also as well, if you're shooting portraiture a lot and you're hand holding it, uh, it's a comfort thing. Uh, normally, instead of having to hold the camera over, you can hold it via the, um, uh, not battery grip, but the, the controls at the bottom as well. Uh, the viewfinder is higher resolution as well. So it will depend on whether or not those features are important to you. If they are, fair enough, the GFX100 is, is a superb camera. Uh, of course it is, it's top of the range. However, the images will be the same out of both. So it depends on how you want to use it and how much you need to be able to tether and power at the same time, or how much portrait you do and how much you want to be able to hold it by the vertical grip. Um, you mentioned that the tilt adapter is uh, not so important to you. Fair enough. For me, I like to use mine an awful lot, especially when I'm shooting waist level because I like to look through. It reminds me of an old chimney finder because I'm a little bit old school, but also as well through portraiture because um, I can find that sometimes I can be taller than my subjects. I'm not hugely tall, I'm about six foot, um, but my other half is, is quite short. She's about five foot and a bit. So when I'm shooting a portrait on her, instead of having to point the camera down at her and she's always looking up, I can use a tilt adapter and bring it down a little bit and it gives a more natural look through for the shots I'm looking for. So that may be a factor. And of course, I can't do that with the, X100, uh, with the GFX100S. So it depends on your use, but for results, uh, prints on paper, they will be the same. There's the same sense, there's no problems at all. Um, so uh, Paul's mentioned, could you speak a little bit about equivalent lens and aperture sizes uh, equivalent to full frame lenses? Yep, that's no problems at all. 
on the GFX range, because it's larger than full frame, um, to get your equivalent focal length, instead of multiplying by one point something, you multiply by 0.79 times. So it's 21% off. If, like me, you can't do the 1% in your head, 20% is close enough. Uh, so the, the rough conversion is, uh, it's a little bit like dark math, you learn the numbers rather than the measurements. So a 63 mil is about a 50 mil effective on full frame. Uh, the 120 is about a 95. Uh, the 110 is about an 85. The new 80 mil 1.7 is a 65. The 23 is an 18. So as I said, just take 20% off and that will give you in the ballpark of it. Now, the aperture for transmission of light will be the same. So 2.8 to 2.8, that makes no difference. However, the relative depth of field, because it's a larger sensor, is roughly about two thirds of a stock shallower, give or take. So a 2.8 is gonna be the equivalent of about a 2.2 on a full frame. Um, again, the 110 F2 is about a 1.6-ish, give or take on full frame. So it's about two thirds of a stock shallower. So the new 80 mil is about a 1.2, 1.4, give or take. Um, but it's not only just the equivalent focal length that is different on, on the GFX series, compared to the full frame cameras. It's the aspect ratio as well. Now I talked earlier this afternoon about um, GF lenses and how on our X series, uh, because it's a three by two aspect ratio, personally, I tend to shoot landscapes at about a 16 mil, which is a 24 mil effective. Because when I'm doing a landscape, I don't want it to be a little bit letterboxy. I don't want a huge width and not so much height. So I tend to come in a little bit. And then if I need to do anything more, I'll switch to portrait and take a number of shots and stitch them together. On the GFX, because it's a four by three aspect ratio, I can use a wider lens than I would normally use. So the 23 mil, which gives 18 mil effective. And it still gives a lot of foreground and background. So I find myself using a, large, or a wider lens than I would normally do on the X series because of the background and the, and the foreground. That's a personal preference. It's not a quality thing. It's just an aesthetic thing. It's what I like. Um, but I find myself using a wider lens than I would normally because of the height. Also as well for portraiture, you may find that um, on a full frame because it's a three by two aspect ratio, if I'm doing a portrait of someone, I need to be slightly further back because of the width of the shot over the shoulders. So I'd have to be further back um, to get the same shot, which gives me less interaction with my subject. On the GFX, because it's a four by three aspect ratio, I could be a little bit closer and still maintain the width across the shoulder. So it's not as tight in, gives me a little bit more flexibility to crop, but also as well for printing, uh, four by three aspect ratio is kind of eight by six. Um, so that is nice for printing as well. So that's the focal length equivalents, but also as well, bear in mind, because it's a four by three aspect ratio, it's a little bit different. It has a lovely feel to it. I hope that answers the question. Um, so we go through. Um, uh, Matt said, uh, hello, how easy would it be to uh, view the top LCD LED screen under strong sunlight? Um, obviously, on my, I haven't had much sunlight to test it with at the moment, to be fair, because it's the middle of winter and it's pretty dark. But on my 100, which has got the, the same kind of screen, um, I've used it in all sorts of conditions. and It's been absolutely fine. There's no problems at all with that. And that's why I mentioned that perhaps you might want to use the histogram on the top instead of on the screen, because as we all know, LCD screens, although this is very bright, when it's a really bright sunny day, sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to see the rear screen, which is why we'd use a viewfinder. But the histogram on the top screen is nice and clear and legible to read because it's, uh, it's black and white. So nice and clear. Um, I've had no problems on really properly sunny days seeing it clearly. So it's, it's all good. No problems at all there. Um, so uh, Erwin has also commented and said, uh, second question, I use back button focus and have found it necessary to glue a large button onto the very small one on the back of the X series. How is it on the 100S? Um, I personally find it easy. The button can be quite large, but it will also depend on which button you want to use. Now, although back button focus traditionally suggests that the focus can be on the back, what you can do is set it to a different button. I'm assuming that you want it on back button focus to take it away from the shutter release. Uh, which is fair enough. So what you can do, and I have seen other people do it, is um, change the button on the front to uh, AF on. So if you go through and press, turn the camera on, press and hold the display back button for about four seconds, it'll bring up the menu to change uh, all of your settings. In fact, I'll show you on the GFX 100 as I have one here. Um, so if you push and hold display back for four seconds, 
It'll take you through to this screen, which I hope you can all see. And you can go through and change the buttons as you want to. And what you can do is perhaps set the front button to AF on or something else as well. So whatever works for you, there's no right or wrong on that, but you, the buttons are, are easier to use. Or they're, they're larger, there's a little bit more real estate for, uh, for your thumb on the 100S. But you can do, as I said, set it to the front because that's a really big button as well. Uh, where are we? Let's have a look through the rest of the questions. Um, Dennis has said some reviewers said that the joystick was not uh, so easy to use because you had to push before moving the focus points that it often didn't always react. Um, I've had a play with it and I found it to be as responsive and easy to use as everything else in the future film range to be fair. As I mentioned, the pad was a little, the pad was, the pad is a little bit larger um, and it's a little bit more uh, rough as well. So I find it um, more positive to use if that makes sense when I'm picking, if I'm using the 425 focus points rather than 117. If I want to move it exactly to where I want to go, I, I don't miss the point. I don't go past it and then have to come back or, or not reach it. I find it very positive to use. Um, so I, it hasn't reacted like that for me uh, when I've been using it. So pass, it could be a settings thing. What you can do on our cameras as well, uh, depending on the camera, is set the stick to either be live all the time. So as soon as you knock it, it'll change your focus point. You can also set it to be a click in and then react, uh, or you can turn it off entirely if you want to. Uh, so it might have been that on the on the reviewer on that reviewer's camera um, that it was set to activate after it was clicked. Uh, and if that's the case, you could just change it over to be live as it is on the rest of the cameras as well. Um, I have a comment here. Has the low temperature usage been improved over the GFX 100? I mean, could you use the 100S in, out in the elements at minus 15 degrees C? Um, the official line is minus 10 degrees C. That's what it's rated down to. Um, so yeah, the minus 10, which is exactly the same as the rest of the GFX range, including the 100 as well. Um, Matt asked, how would I work out the full frame equivalent focal length with Fujifilm and Hasselblad? Both have different aspect ratio sensor size compared to full frame. Would this be vertical or horizontal? Um, if you want to work out your diagonal across the frame, it's 55 millimeters. Um, but as I said, for uh, angle of view or for equivalent focal lengths, um, you're going to have uh, essentially 0.79 times or 21% or 20% if, you're, if you want to do it quickly. 20% um, off will give you the equivalent focal length. But bear in mind, of course, you've got the, uh, it's a four by three aspect ratio. So if you're shooting in landscape, you've got a little bit more height. And if you're shooting portrait, you've got a little bit more width, but the angle of view will be equivalent to uh, 35 mil or full frame at about 21% off the focal length. If you have a look on our, um, uh, either, either on the website or Wex's website, it should have the 35 mil equivalents and they're absolutely spot on calculated. Whereas I'm doing 20% in my head, they will give it to you exactly. So as an example, the 110 F2, I call it an 85 mil, but the actual number is uh, 87, I think, off the top of my head. So that's how it's angled. Um, that's how it's worked out. And we also give on our specification page for the lenses, we do give the actual angle of view as well, if you want to work it out via that. But if you're going for equivalence, uh, easy rule of thumb is 21% off or 20% off if you're doing it without a calculator. Um, so just scrolling through as well, seeing if there are any other questions. Um, thank you everyone for putting your questions in as well. It's always good to have a load of stuff coming through because it means that we can have a bit of a back and forth. Um, so that's all good. And as I said, if I have missed anything, um, email through to Wex or put it in the Facebook group uh, or put it on the Facebook page um, and it will come to me and I'll be able to answer it afterwards. That's no problems at all. So if I have missed it, because there's a lot of comments coming through, uh, I will answer it later on. Um, Dennis has answered, uh, has asked, is it better to turn off IBIS on a tripod? Um, you can do. Uh, I'm sure the official line is yes. Um, it will depend on the tripod you're using. If you are, um, especially if you're doing something like the, um, are you doing long exposure, something like that. If your tripod is extremely stable, uh, then yeah, you can turn it off. That's no problems at all. I tend not to personally, that's a personal thing. Um, 
because I, I just leave it on and don't worry about it. But yeah, if you're on a tripod, you can turn it off. There's no problems with that at all. But obviously if you're using a tripod that's perhaps on the weight limit or it's a very windy day and you've got wind catching the lens hood and, and shaking the camera a little bit, it might help. So up to you. Um, either way works, there's no problem at all. If in doubt, consult the manual on that one. But I, I use it, uh, I leave it on most of the time with no problems at all. Um, I have a question there just going through as well. Um, yeah, I see on the chat there, uh, if you pre-order now, you'll receive your camera sooner. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've had a lot of demand for it. So if you are interested in it, uh, as, as Tiffany Omex is saying, definitely get on the pre-order because uh, the sooner you pre-order, the sooner you'll get it, which is all good. Um, where are we? Scrolling through. Um, has anyone, just whilst we're on the questions here, uh, has everyone, has anyone on the questions pre-ordered? Are, are these, um, are you asking questions about a camera you've already pre-ordered perhaps? Or is it a case of you're finding out questions from me first before you pre-order? It's always good to see what, uh, uh, what you guys are doing. Uh, so let's have a look through. There's a couple of questions in there which are a little bit in-depth. So what I'll do is I will answer them um, I will answer them uh, in detail afterwards, but I'll put the put the answer up on here um, so that it can be, so you can all see what the answer actually is. Uh, but there's a couple in there that will be a, a lengthy discussion, a little bit longer than I've got now, but I will answer them. That's no problems at all. So I have seen them and I will come back to you. It's all good. So just going through, making sure I have answered what I can answer here in a clear and concise manner. Um, where are we? New film simulations come with the GFX 100 via firmware update. Um, there's a question here. Will the new firm film simulations come to the original GFX 100 and other Fuji cameras via firmware update? Pass is the honest answer. Um, I don't know. I haven't seen that. Obviously, I'm sure you can imagine it's been a bit hectic with the um, 100S launch and the XE4, the 7300, the 80 mm uh, the new 27 mm as well. So um, pass doesn't mean we're not, just means I haven't seen it. So. I don't know is the honest answer to that. Um, where are we going through again a little bit more? Quite a lot of questions, it's all good. Um, there's a question here. Uh, Dennis has said he's already uh, ordered one uh, in the camera shop. Fantastic, good, I'm pleased. That's what we like to hear. Um, no problems at all answering your questions. That's what I'm here for. Um, there is another question here. Does Fuji plan to make the connection and transfer of photos to the mobile app faster? Um, so it will depend on how you're uh, transferring the files. On the camera, there is an option to uh, transfer via Bluetooth and resize for your phone. Now, obviously, if you're sending them across at full size, you will be there for a while because uh, they're big old files. I tend to transfer them over when I'm using the app uh, at full size, but obviously it's a decent size of file. What you can do for speed uh, is transfer the file over. I think it limits it to about three or five megabytes uh, as a quick file, just a thumbnail or, almost, uh, which is more than enough for Instagram if you're, if you're sharing onto that or something like that, or even just for proving um, you can do that. Uh, you can transfer that across, but obviously if you are sending over the, the full size file, it will be a little bit slower, um, but it will depend on, on the scene and the size of the file as well. Um, so we've got a question here about the touch functionality of the rear screen. Um, it, in, in which way the touch functionality? Um, if you're using it for focusing, what you can do is obviously just click on the area that you want to focus. That's no problems at all. And you can choose between having it just touch focus or touch focus and lock. Um, when you're reviewing an image, uh, what you can do is double tap the image and that will take you 100% through to where you focus and then you can touch and move around and that will allow you to review the scene, uh, move across the scene really quickly. I like to use that, especially in the studio, because you double tap it and it will go obviously to the subject's eye because that's what I focus on. But I can then just move around the scene quickly, just push and move across the screen for making sure that the scene overall looks good. I can also pinch and zoom out as well. So it's really quick for reviewing. If you don't want to use the touch screen, um, maybe you're wearing gloves or something like that, you can do a similar way of controlling it. Um, via clicking in the rear command dial. And this goes not only for the 100S, but 
across the range. Um, if you click in the rear command dial when you are reviewing an image, that'll again take you 100% to your focus point. Um, and then you can either wind the dial out for zooming out, wind the dial in for, yeah, wind the dial out for zooming out, wind the dial in for zooming in, and you can use the joystick for moving around the image as well if you want to. Uh, but it depends on how you're doing it. The rear screen is really quick, especially if you just want to pinch out and zoom out really quickly. Uh, but if not, you can do it through the controls. Either way, whichever works for you, you can do. When you're shooting video, you can set the screen for silent controls. So instead of having to change perhaps uh, aperture or shutter speed by rolling the command wheel, which if you're using a mic on camera might transmit a click through to the sound, you can touch the screen and change your settings through there as well. Uh, so it's silent. So whichever way you want to do it, you can do. Uh, it's easy. And for when you're shooting as well, if you're shooting, so I'm left eyed. Um, so I tend to shoot my nose hits the right side of the screen. If you are using the screen with the touch screen turned on for autofocus, to avoid your nose poking the screen and autofocusing somewhere or choosing the focus point there, what you can do is get the screen to ignore a certain area for the touch screen. So I have it set to, when I'm using the touch screen, I have it ignore the right side um, as a whole. You can also break it down by quadrants as well. So you can have it ignore top left or top right, however you want it. But I tend to have it just ignoring one side and then I don't touch the focus with my nose and make it focus somewhere else. Uh, we have another question. What are the benefits of medium format considering setting my full frame and buying GFX 100S? I mostly do portrait photography. Um, so uh, apart from resolution, which is an obvious one, um, as I mentioned, the aspect ratio of four by three uh, will give for portraits especially a little bit more width. So it gives a little bit more flexibility and, and freedom around the shot. It's not just a case of if you wanted to shoot a portrait and you need to get the subject in a little bit of the background you'd have to stand further away. You don't need to as much, which means that you don't have to use a longer lens, which will compress the face a little bit. You can use a focal length that perhaps you might want to. So you might want to use something like the new 80 mil, which is a 65 mil equivalent. And that keeps a nice natural shape to the face um, for portraiture, because you're not having to be so far away because you'll still be able to get the um, shoulders in as well for the width. On top of that, medium format or larger than full frame sensors because they are larger, we'll have a shallower depth of field for a set aperture. And it has a, a really smooth and natural fall off for the bocker as well. So it's not just a case of higher resolution, better dynamic range, larger file size. It's a, it's a feel of it as well. So you'll have a beautiful, beautifully sharp image, as you would expect, but the bocker will drop off really nicely and naturally. So you won't get those kind of shots where it's just subject blur. It's a nice gradual transition. Obviously, when you're using something like the 80 mil 1.7 or the 110 f2, uh, that you, you'll still get very shallow depth of field, but it looks smoother as well. And for a fixed aperture, so if you're shooting f4, for example, the relative depth of field on medium format or larger than full frame sensor will give you a shallow depth of field relatively. On top of that, obviously, you've got uh, large pixels, so you're going to have a uh, you're going to have a nicer dynamic range. It's sharper. I mean, the, the lenses on the GF system, the GFX lenses, are designed to run in excess of 100 megapixels. So you're getting a lot of detail. When I talked about lenses earlier in the day, I talked about how they were um, the, the task that was given to the engineers when they designed the GFX system. So when you, have a, uh, when you have a lens design, if you go up a format size, so for example, from uh, full frame to medium format to large format sensors, the chromatic aberration, if you change nothing but the design, when you upscale, the chromatic aberration as a ratio will increase in line with the sensor size increase. Now, the engineers were tasked with maintaining the same physical amount of chromatic aberration on the GF lenses as there is on the X series lenses. So not only are they extremely sharp, they also have, in theory, less chromatic aberration than they would normally be expected to design uh, to counter. So they're extremely sharp. So you're getting larger sensor, higher resolution, shallower depth of field, a, a richer tone, richer dynamic range, but you're also getting extreme detail as well. So medium format versus full frame uh, or, or larger than full frame sensors versus uh, full frame um, has a certain look about it, but it's, it's more detail, greater tonality, uh, higher dynamic range, larger files, the ability to crop in as well if you need to. Uh, you can really go in on, on a subject in a way that you perhaps couldn't on full frame. Uh, 
So it, it's all of those things to give you a, a feel and a look, and especially on portraiture, something that you just can't replicate on full frame. So uh, we have a question as well. How about pinch to zoom live in view for critical focusing? What you can do with a touch screen, I tend not to do that. Um, what you can do is on the rear command dial, this is the way I work. Uh, if you click the rear command dial in, that will allow you to crop in on your image uh, in live view. And then you can uh, wheel in and wheel out for zooming in and out as well. If you are doing critical focusing uh, as well, what you can do is change the camera to uh, manual focus. And then I tend to use peak focus assist. Um, and I tend to use it with red and highlights or red high rather than red low. And the reason I choose red is that it allows red contrast mostly with nature, especially if you're doing landscape or something like that. Obviously there isn't any red grass. So um, click in the rear command dial and you can go in and that will give you the option to really see exactly what the focus is doing and whether or not it's sharp. You don't have to use peak focusing. You can just use it as normal and see exactly what's going on. And of course, if you're using through the viewfinder as well, that's gonna be a nice, bright, clear image for really getting in on the detail. And that's how I tend to do it because you can choose exactly how much uh, you're zoomed in and out for critical focusing. So that, that's the way I work. Um, click in the rear command dial and you can roll in and roll out for your focus checking. Uh, where are we? Uh, I have a question about the raw histogram or JPEG. Um, so it'll be the, the histogram coming out of the camera will be the JPEG, I believe, um, because it will be set for the film simulation because the raw file coming off the sensor, um, when you see it on camera, always has a tone curve applied because you're not seeing the pure data coming off the sensor, you're seeing the film simulation. So be it across if you're shooting like I am or Velvia or whatever. So you'll have a slightly different tone curve. So the histogram is showing you the JPEG across. Hope that answers that one. Um, John has said, I'm nervous about dealing with such large file sizes with the JFX. Are those who use such cameras finding they're coming across any issues with workflow dealing with such large file sizes? Um, so I'm using at the moment, I'm, I'm on here, I'm using a 2017 MacBook Pro. Um, base spec with a slightly larger hard drive. Uh, the file size coming off the back of the 100 and 100S are the same. Um, obviously, if you're going to try and shoot a thousand images and then batch process them, probably not. But for the kind of photography that I do with medium format, so it's a, it's a more considered photography. Obviously, you can do sports. It has got the five frames per second on the mechanical shutter. Um, but because I'm not shooting off five, 600 images at once and, and then trying to edit them, I tend to find that the, this is absolutely fine at processing. Um, obviously, a newer laptop would be faster, but if I can run it with this, then depending on your workflow, as long as you're sensible with it, uh, it shouldn't be a problem as well. Uh, equally, when I'm doing a little bit of the pixel shift, uh, because I've played with that on the, on the 100 and the 100S, um, that's doing a 400 megapixel file, and there's, there's a lot of processing going on. Again, it's not done immediately but it's not a kind of let it go and then make a cup of tea and come back it's it's pretty quick so as long as you're realistic with your expectations uh, i wouldn't have a problem at all and obviously it, that's in the raw when you're shooting jpegs which i tend to do a little bit as well because the file size is so lovely um, the colors that come out of it are absolutely spot on um that that's no problems at all that's nice and fast to open as well so as with everything, uh, it depends on what you're doing with it, but as long as you're realistic about what, what your computer is capable of, it shouldn't be a problem at all. Uh, John has also said, uh, I adore the 16.14 on my X-T2. Yeah, cracking lens, I love the 16 mil on the X-Series. Um, the same for the little 23 mil F2. Are there equivalent focal lengths on the GFX, something in the ballpark? Uh, yes, so. Um, for those shooting Fujifilm X series um, and looking at the GFX, if you want to know the rough equivalence of focal lengths, and again, this is a little bit rough, so there's a little bit of math to either side. If you half the GFX lens, that'll give you the lens on X series. And equally, if you double the lens on X series, it'll give you what the focal length or what the lens would be on the GF series. So 16 mil is going to be about a 30 mil, uh, give or take. It's the 30 mil on the GF lens, which gives you 24 effective, 16 gives you 24 effective. So those will be about equivalent. So yeah, double it and you're about there. 
Um, that's a quick way of, of working that out. Uh, the 23 mil F2 would be the, uh, gives you 35 effective. Uh, the 45 on the GF series gives you 35 effective. Um, it's a 45 2.8. So for relative depth of field, it's going to be about a 2.2. So that's almost equivalent. So if you're looking at doing a, a or looking at replicating your X series lenses in GF, uh, the 16 would be the 30 mil and the 23 would be the 45. Uh, yeah, that's right. It's a lot of math this time of night. It's all good. Um, Dennis has asked, is there a lower resolution of the EVF very noticeable compared to the GF1, uh, GFX100? Um, yeah, it is, it is. If you're looking for it, yes. I mean, the resolution on the, on the 100S is absolutely fine. Um, nothing to be, to be laughed at at all. It, it's perfect. It's the same as we've got on the X-T4 and it's very bright and very clear and it's absolutely fine. Obviously, if you are doing extremely critical focusing, uh, then the higher resolution viewfinder on the 100 might be more useful for you, but it depends what you're doing. Um, I haven't, whilst there is a difference, I don't find it to be a disadvantage. It's more than usable and absolutely fine. As I said, it's the same as on the X-T4. Uh, so that's no problems at all. Um, but obviously if you put them side by side, you will see a difference. Uh, John said, thank you, no problems at all. That's all good. Um, I'm just going through the rest of the questions because whilst I was answering those, there's been a few more questions coming through. Uh, where are we? Um, no, it looks all good. It looks all good. As I said, there's a couple of questions on there that, that would take me longer to answer than I've got currently. Um, so what I'll do is I'll come back and I'll put the answer in here. And, and as I said, if you and if any of you have any queries or any questions, um, that I've missed or something comes up to you later on and you think about it and go, you know what, I wish I'd asked. Um, put them through to Wex on their, on their Facebook page. You can go through that or email them directly. Uh, if they can't answer them, because to be fair, they do know what they're talking about. Uh, if they can't answer them, they will put the question to me and I will get an answer for you. I'm just having a look through just in case there are any other questions. Um, but if there aren't, uh, I, will, I will sign off and say thank you very much. We'll just have a quick look coming through. Um, just in case I've missed anything that I could answer here as well, just through. Uh, where are we? No, it looks all good. Okay, well, thank you very much everyone for tuning in. Thank you for your questions as well. Uh, it's been good to talk. I hope you found it informative. As I said, any queries or any questions, um, I will have a look on there, pop through the WEX Facebook page and I will answer them as best I can. Thank you very much.